Good morning, everyone. Happy blessed Sabbath day. I hope you can all hear me. Amen. Yes, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, today, uh, in the few minutes we have, uh, we're going to talk about something that we do, that, and sometimes we don't do it very well. But it does put us at a disadvantage. So I would like somebody to go to Luke chapter twenty, chapter eleven, verse twenty-four to twenty-six. So when I ask for that person to read, then they can read the passage. But before we do that, let us bow our heads for prayer. Lord, as we study your word, open our minds and help us to understand. Not only the times you are living in, but the seriousness of the issues that are in hand. Help us not to be a, a group of people, dear Lord, who are just wishers, but the people who are serious, who know they have a place to go and a battle to fight to get there. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this time to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 26, the Bible says that, that he may sanctify and cleanse, he's talking about the church, he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he may present it to himself. Look at what is to be presented. A glorious church. What kind of church? Not having a spot wrinkle, or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. So when Christ comes, that's the condition we should be. In Revelation chapter uh, 21, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, and I'll take verse 27, 23 says, <clears throat> talking about Jerusalem, the new city, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the lamp is the light thereof. Now, verse 27, verse 27 now, talking about, remember we saw in Ephesians, we saw the condition of the church, now we are seeing what's what needs to the condition of the people who will enter into the heavenly king, into the kingdom, into the glorious city. And they shall in no wise enter into it. Anything, not something, but anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. These are, these are the people who are going to enter into the city. Titus then tells us, because somebody might say, but I'm living today. Titus then tells us that in Titus chapter 2, uh, looking at verse 11, Titus says, tells us now, for the time that you and I are living, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that deny what? And godliness and worldly lust. How? Why? What should we do? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This is how God's people should be. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. However, this is how we should be living today. Righteously, soberly, in this present world. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 then says to us, tells us we are engaged in a fight against an enemy we cannot see 
because we fight against principalities, against powers. We can't see them, but they can see us. Therefore, given that is the condition that heaven requires of us, therefore, given that we are engaged with an enemy we cannot see, therefore, the choices we make every day becomes key. What you choose to do today, the choices you make, will indicate whether you are on the enemy's side or you are somebody who is being purified for heaven. Now, can somebody read now Luke chapter 11, verse 24 to 26? When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none. He saith, I will return to my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of this man is worse than the first. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the first question we have when we look at this passage, saints, is this. What is an unclean spirit? What is an unclean spirit? Great controversy, 513, 513 gives us the explanation. Evil spirits or unclean spirits or demons or devils or foul spirits, same, describing the same thing. Evil spirits in the beginning created sinless were equal in nature, power, and glory with the holy beings that are now God's messengers. They were just as powerful as the holy angels. They were equal in nature. But fallen through sin, they are now leagued together for the dishonor of God and for the destruction of man. Which means, among the devil and all his evil angels, when it comes to the destruction of human beings, they are united. United with Satan in his rebellion and with, the, with him cast out of heaven, they have through all succeeding ages cooperated with Satan in his warfare against divine authority. The evil angels and Satan cooperate for the destruction of man. Now, here is my first question in this passage. How did the unclean spirit leave the man? How did he leave the man? Verse 24 says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Now remember, when unclean spirits were in the presence of Jesus, when these demons were in the presence of Jesus, Jesus rebuked them. Jesus commanded them out. Jesus permitted them to go into the pigs, and then the pigs went over the cliff and they died. Here, the unclean spirit is going out of the man. This is key, saints. Very important. Watch this. This is what is called a tactical withdrawal. Now, let me explain. Because Wikipedia gives me, gives us an explanation here. A tactical withdrawal or a, retreative, a retreating defensive action is a type of a military operation generally, meaning that retreating forces draw back while maintaining contact with the enemy. So what does this mean then for us in this passage? That means the unclean spirit left voluntarily as he saw fit. Which means Satan can give charge to his evil angels to retreat, to make it appear that the man is no longer under the control of evil forces. The man for a while seemed not to be under the power of the devil and does not commit sin anymore and is not followed by temptations. The man seemed for a while to have conquered these evil tendencies, inherited or cultivated. So Satan says, 
She's now going to church. Withdraw. Let her go to church. She's having a Bible study. Withdraw his forces. Let her go. Desire of Ages 3.23 then says to our saints, there were many in Christ's day as they are today, over whom the control of Satan for the time seemed broken. And the key word here is, for the time seemed broken. Through the grace of God, they were set free from the evil spirits that held dominion over the soul. Now, here is my question, sir. When you read this passage, what does the unclean spirit call the man? Can some, uh, is, is somebody see that? What does the unclean spirit call the man where it has come out of? It calls the man my house. Now, let me ask you. You are, you are in your house today. When you leave your house, or when you are in your house, who determines where the fridge goes? Who determines where the sofas go? Who determines what color of paint you put on the wall? It is you, because it is your house. Therefore, the man is used by the unclean spirit as it desires. The unclean spirit rules the man. The unclean spirit's will is obeyed. There is no controversy between the man and the unclean spirit. And for a time, there is some kind of peace between the two. Now, question. If the unclean spirit is coming out of the man, goes out of a man, and it walks about in dry places, it means it must have entered into the man the first, in the first place. So how did the unclean spirit enter into the man? Here are some reasons, saints, how the devil gains dominion over us. This is how the devil gains control of us, of our will, saints. Listen, Christ will give strength to all who seek it. No man without his own consent, can be overcome by Satan. The tempter has no power to control the will or to force the soul to sin. He can do it, saints. So you need to ask yourself, if he cannot do it, who can do it? He may distress, but he cannot contaminate. He can cause agony, but not defilement. So, how does he do it? Because remember I said, we are fighting against the enemy we cannot see, but he can see us. But this is how he can see. This is how he does it, saints. It is done through the control of the will. And what is the will? The will is the power of choice. You make the choice. You and I make the choice. Here's the first statement. You find this in Desire of Ages 125. It says, but every sinful desire we cherish, every sinful desire we cherish, affords him, that is Satan, a foothold. How much is a foot, saints? How much is a foot? 30 centimeters. Nearly about 30 centimeters. So if you put it into this statement, if you say, every sinful desire we cherish, we afford Satan 30 centimeters of control in our lives. We are giving him. We are basically saying, Satan, here's 30 centimeters of my life. Control it. Because we cherish sin. Since he can't force us, he can only do it through the choices we make. How? Every point in which we fail of meeting the divine standard is an open door by which he can enter to tempt and to destroy. Him. 
Mind character and personality, page 26, says, Satan cannot touch the mind or intellect unless we yield it to him. We give it to him, sir. To say Satan control. Why? Because every time we fail to meet the divine standard that we know, every time we cherish a little bit of sin, we are giving Satan an advantage over us in this battle. Saints, of all that I have read in this, in this Bible studies, here is one statement, saints, that I found that we are against a cunning, deceptive, dangerous enemy, and we ought to be careful what we choose to do. Listen to this statement. So long as we are ignorant of their wiles, that is evil spirits or unclean spirits, they have almost inconceivable advantage. How? Many give heed to their suggestions. Now listen, saints, carefully. I'll read it twice. Tw I'll read it twice so you can understand. Many give heed to their suggestions while they suppose themselves to be following the dictates of their own wisdom. This is why, as we approach the close of time, when Satan is to work with the greatest power to deceive and to destroy. So long as we are ignorant of their wiles, they have almost inconceivable advantage. Many give heed to their suggestions while they suppose themselves to be following the dictates of their own wisdom. This is why, as we approach the close of time, when Satan is to work with the greatest power to deceive and to destroy, great controversy 516. Now, let me put that into my Shonglish. It is this Shonglish, meaning English and Shona, I mix so I can understand it in my head. In other words, because we are cherishing sin, because we are not meet, we are failing, we are not meeting the divine standard, because of the choices we are making, it gives Satan an advantage this way, saints. He can make a suggestion to you and I in our mind or in our choices. And this, and then we do those choices that Satan is suggesting. But we are deceived in thinking that it is us who is thought of it. And Satan can cause you to do things and make you think that you are the one who is thought of it. And then all the while is him. Choice is saints. The enemy is preparing for his last campaign against the church. He has so concealed himself from view that many can hardly believe that he exists. How? Boasting of their independence, they will, under his specious bewitching influence, obey the worst impulses of the human heart and yet believe that God is leading them. Oh, saints, this is deception, saints. You can do things and believe that God is leading you. When all the while it is Satan. How does he gain this advantage? Because of the choices we make, the decisions we make, we are opening the door when we should have closed the door. Okay. Because of time, saints, I'm going to cut it into small in the small passages so that we can finish on time. And otherwise, it would have taken us longer than this. Right. Now, the unclean spirit goes out of the man, but he comes back. Right? And he dwells in the house, or he's living in this house. In other words, he's taking control of the will. Now, saints, you need to listen to this. This is where, saints, we you and I need to be very careful what we say, what we do, the things we say, saints. Listen to this statement. 
the Review Herald, March 22, 1887. Listen to this statement. The adversary of souls. Here is the advantage we have now over him, even though we cannot see him. We have an advantage. Here it is. The adversary of souls is not permitted to read the thoughts of man. He cannot read my mind. Sir. He cannot read. Satan cannot read your mind and tell what you're thinking. So how does he know? So that he can deceive us. How does he know? This is how he knows things. But Satan, the adversary of souls, is not permitted to read the thoughts of men. But, but he is a keen observer. And he marks the words. He takes account of the actions. And skillfully adapts his temptations to meet the cases of those who place themselves in his power. This is why it's dangerous to always talk of discouragement, of despair, of hopelessness. You are a child of the living God who created the heavens and the earth and the, all the universe around you. So you cannot afford every day to talk of hopelessness, of discouragement, of despair, of the difficulties of life. That shouldn't be your focus. Your focus should be heavenward. Your focus should be, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That should be your focus. Christ says, all power is given unto me. Then he says, go and preach and teach. So we can't afford to be a people who are always hopeless. But we should be a hopeful people because Christ is about to come to take us home where there will be no more sin, no more dying, no more death. So the words we speak, the actions we take, Satan then will then use that to adapt his temptations to us. Then you hear people, you hear people say, it just so happened, I just ended up doing it. I don't know what happened. It just so happened. No, it did. No, it didn't. From way back yonder there, you have been speaking it. And slowly and surely, Satan has been shaping circumstances that when you get to point here, B, everything is ready for you. Then you commit to the sin. Then you say to yourself, I didn't know. I don't know what happened. No, you didn't. You've been speaking it and you've been acting it. Now, saints, when Satan takes control of your will, it doesn't mean that you are frothing at the mouth and you are rolling on the floors. No, 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 no. It's not always the case, saints. Listen. In John chapter 6, verse 67 and, 60 and, and 71, you will find the story of the disciples. You know, when Jesus spoke the truth and the disciples left, uh, uh, 70 of them left and then the 12 were left Jesus then makes a statement where he says I have chosen you 12 and yet one of you is a devil it doesn't mean he was necessarily the devil himself it's just that his control his will was under the control of the devil those possessed with devils are usually represented as being in a condition of great suffering yet there were exceptions to this rule now we're going to go into the exception the exception is Judas Right? The exception is Judas. But if you read the passages I've given you, we won't go through them because of time. Uh, John 6, 67, 71, John 12, 3 and 6, and John 13, verse 11. You find Judas, is the, if you follow, you see Judas all over those passages. Judas did not come out boldly in opposition to Christ. And therefore, he was able to deceive the other disciples. Christ knew that Judas was possessed of the demon of selfishness. And yet Judas was in church. That's why I told you, saying, he can withdraw his forces saying, and let you go to church. But he knows that when you are out of church, back or home, when you are by yourself, you've got things and choices that you make that are conducive for you not to meet the divine standard. When somebody's not watching, Satan is there. He knows that you engage in some activities that are ungodly, 
that are sinful. You may excuse them. We may find reasons for doing them. But according to the scriptures, it's sin. Listen to the skills of Judas, who we have just read here in, 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 in a manuscript 162, 1902. Judas was the possessed of the demon of selfishness. But look at how, how Judas conducted himself. Judas, you know, when Mary uh, poured that ointment, expensive ointment, and Judas said, well, is she, in, Jude, in John chapter 12, he, it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. That's a very good suggestion, see? It is good to care for the poor. When you read that passage, you would think Judas cared for the poor. But the Bible tells you he was a thief. It doesn't mean when the devil is got in control of you or possesses you, you can make good suggestions. You can do good things. You can. You can. Here's the example of Judas. Listen now in Desire Pages 559, how Judas is described. Judas had a high opinion of his own executive ability. A financier, is, he thought himself greatly superior to his fellow disciples. He had led them to regard him in the same, in the same light, and he had gained their confidence. He professed sympathy for the poor, deceived them, that is the disciples, and his artful insinuation caused them to look distrustfully upon Mary. That is Judas. So the unclean spirit now, let me just finish. I want to finish in the next five minutes. The unclean spirit goes out, saints. Then it comes back. And then it looks, it says, the Bible says, it finds that the house is swept and garnished. Now tell me, think about it, saints. How can you, when you are standing outside of the house, see that the house, the floor is clean, is clean, it's swept, that the furniture is tightened, it's all nicely set up and, and, and clean. How do you do that? Thing? You can only do that if you enter into a house. That means the unclean spirit was able to go and it was able to come back in. How? Now, as in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible says, I stand at the door and knock and enter in. If any man opens, I will come in and sup with him. As it works for Jesus, saints, as Jesus knocks on the door, Satan also knocks on the door. Because both cannot force your will. You have to give them permission to come in. Now, here is how the evil spirit was able to come back. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3.20. Every warning, saints, every reproof, and entreaty in the word of God or through his messengers is a knock at the door of the heart. Now, wow, wow. It is the voice of Jesus asking for entrance. He asks, just as Jesus asked, so Satan asked. Nobody forces. With every knock unheeded, the disposition to become, the disposition to open becomes weaker. So if you don't listen and don't respond to the knock of Christ, your ability to hear becomes weaker and weaker. The impression of the Holy Spirit, if disregarded today, that's why we read Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. If the Holy Spirit is disregarded today, will not be as strong as tomorrow. The impressions of the Holy Spirit disregarded today's saints will not be as strong as tomorrow. The heart becomes less impressible and lapses into a perilous unconscious. So the, the, the evil spirit went out, came back, and then it knocked on the door. Then the man recognized the knock, the man recognized the voice, and he opened the door, and the evil, unclean spirit came in, saw so what had happened, and then he left. 
The house is damaged, but the property is not old. It was never surrendered to Christ, who took, nor inhabited by the Spirit. Sweeping takes care of the visible dust, while the sin that so easily beset us is left untouched or unsearched up. Saints, this is when we go to church, saints, and we hear someone and we say, somebody says, those who want to commit themselves to Christ, stand up, or raise your hand, boom, your hand goes up. But the sin that so easily beset us is not searched out and cleansed from the soul. So that is why the unclean spirit would come back. Because of time, saints, we're going to stop here. The next time, we will continue in another day. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Because next time we will find out when the unclean spirit comes back and settles down. What happened? So let's stop here, saints, because of time. And in another time, in another opportunity, we will conclude. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for giving us this time to study this, the first part of this passage. Now, Lord, as we prepare to go to our various churches, as we have read in the spirit of prophecy, as we have read in the scriptures, help us to make the right choices. Especially those decisions when we are by ourselves and nobody else is watching. Please help us. For those sins, especially with the sins that so easily beset us, Help us to leave them aside. Cleanse the body temple from every defilement so that you can, we can be a people without spot and without blemish. Then we will be ready for translation. Continue to guide us. Continue, us, continue to lead us to fight this battle with courage and boldness. Help us to call sin by its rightful name. Not to compromise with sin or to sympathize with the sins. Uh -uh. But to stand boldly against the sin and to raise the standard high. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.